Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, Analytical Psychology Seminars from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Episode 15, Consciousness, Theory of Ego and Ego Complex, with Murray Stein, Ph.D. This episode is part one of the series, The Jungian Psyche, A Deeper Look at Analytical Psychology. The course, recorded in 1991, offers a careful exploration of some of Jung's key theoretical texts. Aimed at giving the advanced student of analytical psychology a greater appreciation of the details of Jung's theoretical model of the psyche, the class proceeds in a systematic fashion through the basic concepts and considers how they interrelate to form a whole. Suggested readings from Jung's collected works are announced at the start of each class section. During this talk, Dr. Stein discusses Jung's Aeon, researches into the phenomenology of the self, the emergence of the term ego, and the theory of complexes. Murray Stein, Ph.D., is a training analyst at the International School for Analytical Psychology in Zurich, Switzerland. His most recent publications include The Principle of Individuation, Jung's Map of the Soul, and the Edinburgh International Encyclopedia of Psychoanalysis. He lectures internationally on topics related to analytical psychology and its applications in the contemporary world. The complete series, The Jungian Psyche, A Deeper Look at Analytical Psychology, is available in our store, and there's a link in the show notes, or you can go to jungchicago.org slash store. This is Murray Stein's course on the Jungian Psyche, a deeper look at analytical psychology. There were several required readings for the course, selected from Jung's collected works, and they will be announced at the start of each session. For the first session, Consciousness, Theory of Ego and Ego Complex, the assigned readings are the chapters on the ego and the shadow in Collected Works, Volume 9, Part 2, and the general description of the types in Collected Works, Volume 6. What I would like to do... Uh, and what I thought about in, in presenting this uh, course outline was to um, try to present uh, a more or less coherent picture of Jung's theory, his psychological theory, and it will proceed in in parts that uh, I think as time goes on you'll see are linked together. So if you're here for the whole two weeks, I'm hoping that you'll have both an overview of of the whole psychological theory and what Jung created in that theory, as well as some understanding of the details and the parts of that theory. So it's an attempt to present the coherence while looking at some depth at the parts. And each of the... uh, um, Each day of this course has a title to it and a set of readings. Have you all gotten the readings? Mm -hmm. It's very important that you do these readings because our discussion will be at least somewhat based on the readings. And the readings will give you the the word from the horse's mouth, as so many people say. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the real thing. This is Jung himself speaking. It isn't anybody else speaking about him. So it's an opportunity to immerse yourself in these primary documents to try to figure out what Jung was saying for yourself, and then we'll come together and discuss these readings uh, one at a time as we go through these two weeks. Um, I selected these readings uh, in a kind of subjective way. There perhaps would be some better readings to go with each of these topics. I don't know, but these are the ones that came to my attention as I was thinking about um, how to, uh, how to assign readings for each of these subjects. Well, let me begin by just giving you a very brief uh, sketch of Jung's uh, life and work, and I mean very brief, like five minutes or less. Um, I want to say that Jung had more or less created the major elements of his theory by 1930. So you can think of 1930 as a 
semi-important date in Jung's work. It divides almost exactly in half his productive life into two parts, the first part and the second part. He started in 1900 as a psychiatrist, and he died in 1961 as a wise old man, Krishnach, Zurich, just outside of Zurich on the lake of uh, Zurich. And uh, in the first 30 years, he was extremely creative in putting together uh, the elements of a uh, what would become a massive psychological theory. And the second 30 years, the second half of that career, he spent elaborating the details and particularly addressing collective issues, cultural issues, issues of religion, issues in history, uh, less clinical in orientation and focus, and much less creative in some ways in elaborating theory because the elements were all there already. So he, is, he doesn't come up with new theoretical constructs much in the second half of his career, but he's filling in the details of what he had intuited uh, long before. Now, the seeds of his whole psychological theory, some people claim they can find already before 1900 in some rather uh, informal papers that he wrote and talks he gave while he was an undergraduate at the University of Basel. These have been collected, put together in a volume called the Zofingia Lectures. And they're sort of pre-psychiatric Jung. They're, they're not in the collected works. Uh, but they do contain uh, the young Jung struggling with issues that will preoccupy him throughout his life. What is it to be empirical an empirical scientist if you're interested in a subject like religion and mysticism? Is it even possible to address that? Or is that just outside the realm of science altogether so that it's something that scientists cannot tackle? Well, he felt that he could, that it should be a subject for investigation. And so some of his thoughts are running along those lines. And you get a sense of his <clears throat> some of his uh, biases and uh, basic intellectual commitments already as early as as that period. But um, the, uh, <clears throat> the ideas that we're going to be talking about in this course were, were uh, out there on the table by 1930, but some of them hadn't been very much elaborated. Certainly the theory of the self, which we'll talk about later, and concepts like synchronicity, um, and, and the theory of archetypes are, even by 1930, just sort of vague, uh, prelimi in a vague preliminary state. And uh, it will take him another 30 years to really complete what he started. Uh, Jung's life work is a massive uh, achievement of uh, intellect and observation and creativity. Very few people... Uh, are able to produce what Jung produced in his 18 volumes of the collected works plus um, other papers like his letters and, and um, various interviews that are collected here and there and his autobiography. All that is outside of his collected works. So we're looking at a mountain of material uh, and trying to sort out uh, what are some of the major themes in all of that, and um, can we see the whole as well as go and boring into some of the details? There is a question about Jung, uh, Jung's work uh, that's sometimes raised, and the question is, is there really a system there? Is Jung a systematic thinker? And I think the answer to that probably is a guarded Yes, but a very guarded one. There is a coherent theory there, but he's not a systematic thinker in a strict sense, like a philosopher might be a systematic thinker, building on basic premises and making sure that each part of the whole fits together with the others and looking at all the details of, of uh, where uh, one thing and another thing may not match up exactly and making arguments to justify his positions and that sort of thing. He isn't that, he's an intuitive thinker. Uh, and so you get big concepts put out there and then 
more or less elaborated in some detail, and then another big concept put out there, and you can begin to see how they must fit together in Jung's mind. And if you read his whole work, you can see they really do. And he's using these same concepts and bringing them out over and over again. And as he does that, sometimes he says one thing one place, that he contradicts another place, and he doesn't worry overly much about that. So a lot of people say, well, he's very inconsistent in his use of terminology. Uh, sometimes he talks about the anima, for example, one way. Sometimes he talks about it another way, and they don't exactly fit together. And... Uh, Jung wasn't overly concerned with those kinds of details, as most intuitives aren't. Uh, leave that to the other people, that, you know, crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Smaller minds can deal with that. And uh, I think Jung sort of took that kind of an attitude. I'm about the business of, of uh, stating a vision that I've got. I think he saw something, and he tried to put that out there in the course of time. And... Uh, so I think as we try to look at it as a coherent theory, we're going to have to um, keep that in mind and not get overly obsessed with consistency and inconsistency. Uh, although I think there are certainly interesting questions to be raised in that regard. Um, so is there a system, I would say, um, not really a system, but certainly a coherent theory lies in this mass of material? with rough spots, gaps, and sometimes vague statements that don't exactly match up. Uh, Jung once himself said, when he was accused of being inconsistent, he said, look, I've got my eye on the central fire, and I'm putting mirrors around it, and sometimes at the edges, those mirrors don't fit exactly. I can't help that. Look at what I'm trying to point to. Okay, So it's it's always a bit like that. What's he really trying to get at? And then there are these other details that one can worry about if one wants to. So what I'd like to try to achieve in this course is to show that coherence that is there, to show how the parts do fit together to make a coherent theory, and uh, also perhaps to point out some of the inconsistencies as we go along, such as they are. I don't think they're tremendously important inconsistencies or profound ones, although there are some moderately significant ones. One of the reasons I liked Jung was that he was inconsistent a bit. And and there is, when you study a really systematic thinker and you get into the system, I don't know if this is just my feeling reaction to it, but I start feeling trapped in it, like I want out. This is too tight. Reality can't be like this somehow. It isn't that fixed, and it isn't that definite. So I'm always very suspicious about really tight systems. And uh, Jung's isn't like that. It isn't uh, obsessively tight. Uh, Freud wasn't all that tight either, although he was tighter than Jung. But if you want really tight thinkers, you'd go to the... I guess, the philosophers and other kinds of people. Um, I once had this a very strong reaction like this in reading uh, the works of Reinhold Niebuhr, who's a theologian. I don't know if any of you know him. And there came a point where uh, I felt, um, well, he's answered every question. There's nothing much left to do. And it feels suffocating. It feels like there's nowhere, you know, you can't get out of this thing. And so I sort of put those books down and went on. Uh, but um, some people like that kind of uh, really strong, obsessive, to me at least, to my mind, obsessive, <laughs> tight, uh, self-consistent theory. Well, I thought we could ease into the whole subject by starting with a topic that... Uh, is extremely elusive, elusive, hard to hard to grasp in one sense, and yet is certainly the beginning point of um, what would seem to me one's reflections on psychology and any psychological theory. In other words, starting with what seems most self-evident and obvious, namely that when we're speaking about human psychology we'd have to uh, consider, at some point at least, the whole issue of consciousness. 
And so we'll start at, at the surface, if you will, but it's a very tricky surface, and it's a surface with a lot of depth to it, uh, by considering uh, what Jung had to say about consciousness and then about the ego uh, and gradually deepen, deepening our considerations of that today and looking at uh, a, uh, a section of his book, Ion, the first two chapters on the ego and the shadow, and if we can get through all of that today, I think we'll, we'll be in good shape. Well, consciousness uh, is simply uh, awareness, sentience. When you're awake, you're aware of something. And if you think about um, consciousness itself, what it is, it's awakeness. Now, humans aren't the only ones who display awakeness. Uh, awakeness is the uh, ability to observe and register what's, what's around you, to open your eyes, to be conscious of your environment. Animals have it. Perhaps plants have it in a certain way, sensitive, sensitivities to their environment. We call ours consciousness. But uh, you could also say animals show evidence of various degrees of consciousness, and then we get into the whole question of levels of consciousness, kinds of consciousness, what are you conscious of, who is conscious, and so on. But just starting with consciousness, we can say that an infant, a newborn, has consciousness. A friend of mine told me that he observed the birth of his daughter a couple of weeks ago, and that while the placenta was still sort of wrapped around her, she'd just been born, they removed it and kind of cleaned her eyes and she opened them up and looked around. You know, she looked. She uh, And in the eyes, the eyes, we say, are the center of consciousness. When the eyes are open and they're looking around, we imagine that there is a conscious being there. Well, those eyes are taking in something. But consciousness doesn't depend on eyes. There are ears. There are the senses. And there is a kind of consciousness in the womb. That little infant had been conscious in its uterine life as well, registering sounds probably, uh, reacting to certain things. So a kind of uh, at least preliminary consciousness goes on even in the womb. Nobody knows exactly when it starts in the embryo, but one could imagine that theologians would say when it's there, when consciousness is there, we're talking about a soul. You know, when do you, when can you legit legitimately terminate a pregnancy and not feel like you're murdering somebody or, you know, when they're, when does this, when is the soul born? Well, I could imagine somebody making the argument when there is a rudimentary form of consciousness there, then we can say that is a person. You know, personhood somehow depends in most of our minds on consciousness. And when you see a corpse laid out in the funeral parlor or you know, at a funeral or something, and you go up close to it and it's a person you've known, you're aware that there's something radically wrong here. There's something missing. What is it? This person's not just sleeping. There is no consciousness here. This is simply matter. This is unenlivened matter. So uh, it seems to us that consciousness is very much linked up with the aliveness of matter the ability to interact, react, engage in various activities with the environment and so on. Um, and when it's absent, we, uh, we register that very clearly. Um, when we're dreaming, we're conscious too. We're just in a different kind of consciousness, but it's as though we're experiencing it feels very real in a dream, so we can speak of dream consciousness. We're usually the same person in our dreams that we are in our waking life, uh, but uh, sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're a different person in our dreams, so it's possible to shift consciousness, uh, and that's where we start. it starts getting interesting from a depth psychological point of view when consciousness starts shifting and changing. But for the moment, we're just, uh, we'll just stay with a with the level of uh, consciousness itself. Um, 
Now you can make a distinction between um, consciousness and the contents of consciousness. You say consciousness per se uh, is one thing. This is a uh, an intellectual dis- distinction. Uh, probably uh, there is no such thing as consciousness per se without its being conscious of something. But we can make at least a kind of theoretical distinction between consciousness itself and the contents of consciousness, namely what you're conscious of when you're conscious. And then those contents can be sorted into two parts, <clears throat> namely consciousness of contents that we'd call inner contents and consciousness of contents that we'd call outer contents. Now, this distinction between inner and outer, of course, is uh, subject to great philosophical doubt and question, but uh, I'm just using it as a very approximate uh, notion that is, when you're, when you're aware of inner contents, what are you aware of? You're aware of your emotions, your thoughts, your feelings, uh, fantasies, images, memories. The, the point of reference is inside yourself. If somebody says, what are you thinking about? You, and you, you would answer that question. You talk about something that's going on inside of yourself that can't be observed by anybody else. Okay, so it's inner in that sense. It's interior to your consciousness, and it can't be observed by an outside observer, by another person, if you don't want to tell them. So that's your privilege, your privacy. You can be quiet. You don't have to answer the questions. Um, So you can be conscious of all kinds of things, Um, and we are all the time. We're conscious of our fantasies. We're conscious of our wishes. We're conscious of, of daydreams, thoughts, memories and so on and then there there are contents that are readily observed you're conscious of uh, the world around you somebody says what are you doing what are you thinking about you say well I'm just you know I'm looking at the things around me I'm registering those I'm, I'm thinking about uh, or simply taking in or um, experiencing the trees, the plants, the people in my environment, and so on. That's what's filling my consciousness right now. I'm looking. I'm watching the TV. You know, that's what's going on. Of course, that's also inner, because what you're talking about is what you're, what you're reflecting and, and uh, experiencing within. So in one sense, everything is inner. All contents are inner. There are, are no inner and outer, but the reference points are different. Um, Now, I want to make another distinction, and that is between consciousness as such and a center of consciousness. And here we come upon the subject of the ego. Jung defined the ego as the center of consciousness, and he says things are conscious by virtue of being connected to the ego. So if you think of a fried egg, for example, the yolk is the ego, and the white part around it is the field of consciousness, right? Uh, It has a center. A mandala has a center. You know, there are many images that can uh, represent this. Um, But it's possible to be conscious without having... Uh, a very active center at the moment. In other words, the ego is not activated if you're simply observing something in a neutral way. You're just looking at it or you're thinking your thoughts. Um, Anybody could be doing that. You're like a camera, in a sense. That's simply consciousness, pure consciousness. And for some uh, um, theoreticians of consciousness, and I'm thinking about uh, meditators and religious people, there is a goal. You know, the goal is to achieve pure consciousness without any ego, involvement, detachment. You just observe things. You don't react to them. You don't try to control them. You don't try to do anything with them. You just observe them. And uh, that's a, a state of enlightenment, to observe intensely without trying to change or manipulate or do anything with it. Very few of us can observe for very long 
that way. We can do it for a little while, but pretty quickly we, we get engaged in what we're observing. You go to a movie and you watch it. If it's a, uh, an ordinary movie, it's set up so that you will begin rooting for one side or the other. You'll get invol- emotionally involved in it, and you'll start uh, wishing and desiring and hoping and uh, planning and doing everything that uh, that the uh, person that you're identifying with in the movie is doing. Right? You're engaged, so your ego it becomes active. Um, and you can see the rudimentary uh, states of that in infancy. You know, obviously, the infant doesn't have a commanding knowledge of its environment, but it's noticing something. It's noticing shapes, and pretty soon it, it's, uh, it's evident that, that certain shapes are familiar to it, and uh, some are, are very pleasurable to it, and it, wa- it reaches out for them and wants them, and others it fends off and doesn't want. Um, so mainly it's engaged in uh, being nurtured and taking the breast and feeding and that sort of thing, and and it, it shows a little bit of intentionality. You know, there is a little bit of a center of consciousness. It observes and reaches out and wants and then wants to do something with it. But it's pretty much a reflex action, pretty much. It doesn't have a whole lot of control over that. Okay, but there is a little bit of a center there, you know, a little bit of a center of intentionality. Donna, did you want to ask something? Yeah, I guess but um, I, I got the impression that Jung thought that material, you could be aware of certain things, but yet they were not conscious because they were not under ego control. Like, you could be aware of a reaction that you're having to an individual, but you don't have control over it, and so that's not actually conscious. Um, that's, that's unconscious because your reaction and emotions are coming. Oh, no, you can be conscious of your reaction and of the emotion, but you might be unconscious of what's causing it, you know, the motivator, the source of it. In other words, the complex. We'll get into that mm-hmm. tomorrow. Like, what's going on behind the scenes, so to speak, to cause the reaction. But you can be aware of an emotion like anger or uh, joy or whatever but not really know why. Mm-hmm. Or so there is some unconsciousness and some consciousness there. Mm-hmm. So in a sense, like the field of conscious, when you say something, you reach the state of pure consciousness, then in a sense, the field of consciousness isn't necessarily um, connected to the ego. I mean, the ego's like just... The ego's quiet in it. The ego is there. Jung didn't believe that you could have consciousness without an ego there. They're almost equivalent to him. But he talks about a field of consciousness around the ego, but the ego is a center of consciousness. We'll get into a few more details of that as we go along. Um, the, uh, the point of a center of consciousness is not a... Uh, uh, an emotionally neutral one because that center, that I, is something that when aroused produces intentionality, produces a desire to control. Um, uh, so uh, ego is a word that um, we use in English. When Freud began writing uh, his psychology, he used the word uh, das ich or das es the, the, the I and the it it's a little awkward to talk that way in English in German it's easier to, uh, to turn things into nouns in English it's very awkward so when the translators came along and they asked themselves how shall we translate das ich und das es they came up with Latin words like ego and id superego so on. Das über ich is the superego. That means the over I. It's much more interesting in a way in German, graphic. So it's the I, the it, that's the id, and the over I. It feels a little more human. 
in English, it's much. It's a kind of foreign mechanical language, technical sounding. Bettelheim wrote a book about this a couple of years ago and criticized the translators for, in English, psychoanalysis sounds so much more mechanical and technical than it does in German. Well, that's debatable. I mean, it's pretty mechanical and technical in German, too. But uh, there is a linguistic difference. So when, when we speak about the ego, what we're speaking about is your I, the I-ness of you. When you say I, that's you're, you're, you're making a reference to your ego. I want, I'm going, I plan, I think, I feel. You see, that's the I. The I is in it linguistically and the I is in it psychologically. I am doing it. I am experiencing it. Well, if you think about that I, try to reflect on that, that puts you into, I think, deep, deep waters indeed. Like, what is that I? And if you can isolate that from um, any particular content and just try to focus on the I-ness of you itself, what is that? That's the center of your consciousness. If you close your eyes and you just say, I, I, you get a kind of mystical sense about yourself almost in that I. It, it feels like something that's been there forever. Does that I ever really change from the time you're two years old until now? Is it a different I or is it the same I? Is the I that cries for its mother when you're two or three or four years old, not the same one who cries when it loses a fortune on the stock market <laughs> at 45 or 50. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, it, it is a real question to what extent the I, the essence of the I develops and to what extent it doesn't. There are certainly lots of things that do develop and change cognitively, emotionally, and so on. But at the center of it all, in that, in the heart of the I, uh, there seems to be quite a, a continuity. Uh, a child doesn't say I usually before about the age of two. They can speak. They can. They refer to themselves. A little child will refer to him, herself or himself by name. Say, uh, you know, Timmy Want or Sarah Go, or something like that. Um, it's unclear to me whether the I whether that's a linguistic problem or whether the, whether the I uh, comes into being at the age of two. I have a feeling it's a linguistic thing. And that, uh, of course, language acquisition is a tremendous development in the early years and continues onward into adolescence and so on. <clears throat> and um, But I, I do think there is a center of consciousness and there is an ego before a person can say I. And, and be reflective about I. Now, the human uh, human consciousness and ego consciousness seems somewhat different from animal consciousness because of our verbal abilities. And we can speak about our eyes. The animals just have them. I mean, they, have, they want to live, too. They have a center of consciousness. They go after things. They want to control their environments. And uh, so they, they show evidence of an ego and individuality and, you know, uniqueness and all that that we associate with with the I. They respond to their names the way we do. At a certain point, your name and your I become almost wedded. You know, somebody asks you who you are, you give your name. But is that really your I? I mean, you could have been given another name. You'd have the same I but a different name. You see? I mean, in a way, everything that you put on the I is... Uh, is um, um, secondary to it, including your name, which seems so fundamental, something you identify with before you can even say I. <clears throat> uh, but uh, people change their names. Uh, women have done it for many generations. They change their last names. Sometimes they change their first names. If you take uh, religious orders, you change your name. You become Mother Teresa. Maybe that, maybe Teresa wasn't your name before. So um, names can come and go, and uh, and all that surrounds the I can change. All that you identify with, 
that you uh, claim as your own, that you feel very strongly about, oh, that can change. But the I itself, that I that's doing it, probably doesn't change very much, if at all. Uh, We could even say that's the soul, perhaps, that I. Well, um... In uh, chapter one of Ion, yeah. I always thought that the soul was more um, related to the self than the, than the ego. We'll get into that. Well, you said the I is the soul. I, I'm saying it, it might be, it could be. One, one could think of it that way. And we'll get into that question when we try to relate the ego to the self. What is the connection between the ego and the self? Um... Because in some sense they're they're very intimately related. In some sense they're quite other from one another. Um, Ion is one of those books that uh, you can read many times at many different levels and depths. And I asked you to read the first two chapters of it in preparation for the class today. This book is an oddly constructed one in that the first four chapters were written after the rest of the book had already been composed in order to introduce it because I think somebody came along and said look young nobody in the world is going to understand all this alchemy and Gnosticism and uh, history and all of that stuff without a little bit of introductory comment on what your theory is so then he wrote these early chapters uh, in order to give a kind of working vocabulary or some general understanding of his theory. And they're the most condensed expressions we have from him of some of these uh, uh, um, subjects. Now, this one on the ego um, is brief, and I think it says quite a lot of what Jung wanted to say about the ego Um, and I thought we could take a look at that and at least it's uh, a good introduction to the subject Um, that part of Jung's theory now Jung borrowed the term ego from Freud and psychoanalysis he did not come up with the term ego but he accepted it as a designation for uh, the center of um conscious awareness and in here he says that the ego (coughs) has to be distinguished from the self and that indeed the self includes the ego (coughs) and he has a lot more to say about the self in this book later and not very much more about the ego so we'll save the discussions of the self for another time but um, he defines the ego in the first paragraph by saying it forms as it were the center of the field of consciousness and insofar as this comprises the empirical personality that is what we know what we can know empirical is you know what what is knowable the ego is the subject of all personal acts of consciousness. It's your subjectivity, your subject, as opposed to being the object to yourself when you're the subject to yourself, you're in the ego. The relation of a psychic content to the ego forms the criterion of its consciousness, for no content can be conscious unless it is represented to a subject. <coughs> So the degree to which something is conscious depends on the ego's um, penetration into its depths. Now you can be vaguely conscious of something. In other words, the ego can know it a little bit, uh, but not all the way down to its roots. And one of the purposes of analysis is to try to extend the range of the ego so it knows more of what's going on in the psyche extend the range of consciousness that way. Uh, 
Um, and then he distinguishes conscious from unconscious. And he says consciousness is what we know and the unconscious is what we don't know. Unconscious. So there's a, another distinction between conscious and unconscious, which is very fundamental to Jung's theory, that there are some things inside and outside of us which we know about are related to the ego in some way, can be held in consciousness and looked at, and then there are some things that are outside of consciousness. And that's what we'll begin delving into tomorrow. Uh, what's outside of consciousness is the unconscious. And for our purposes now, that's enough of a definition for the unconscious. It's whatever is outside of consciousness. So what is outside of consciousness? <laughs> Most of the world. Everything you don't know is unconscious to you. If you don't know how many uh, moons uh, uh, revolve around Saturn, that's in the unconscious for you. Right? That's unconscious. That's as unconscious as the archetypes are to you. See, unconsciousness is, is simply a, a term that, that refers to whatever you don't know. What is not a content of your consciousness is the unconscious. Yeah, Rita? Theoretically, if we were really connected, like the universal mind, we would know those things. You'd know everything. If there is a universal mind that knows everything and we were connected to it, yeah. there would be no unconsciousness. Yeah. So, a great, so even, even a great facts big like computer the bank. Moons yeah. Right. Around Saturn or uh, what's going on 2,000 miles away. Yeah. Or what happened a thousand years ago, or mm -hmm. you know. Right. You'd know it already. You'd know it all. That's right. <laughs> you wouldn't have to take those cars. <laughs> so. It proves that we're all unconscious, that we're here in this course, <laughs> having to read these books, study, think about these things. No, you so, still have to read the books, because no one would believe that you knew that you didn't. Uh, well, you wouldn't have to prove it to them. No, but we'd all be that way so we would all be wired in. It, it, it. That's another universe. That's yeah. not ours. Now... Uh, Jung goes on to say that he, he wants to talk about the ego resting on two bases. Two bases. One is somatic and one is psychic. And this is in paragraph three. Now the ego, as a specific content of consciousness... Uh, when we when we uh, arrive at here tomorrow, we're going to be able to use another term, namely complex. And uh, sometimes Jung refers to the ego as a complex. Here he calls it a specific content of consciousness. A specific content of consciousness. Now, there can be others, okay? So keep that in mind. The ego is a specific content of consciousness. So in a sense, consciousness is a bigger category than the ego. The ego is a content of consciousness or a part of consciousness. It's not a simple or elementary factor, but a complex one. And here he uses the word complex in a slightly different way, but uh, it gives you the... Uh, it gives you the inkling of what uh, what is to come, that the ego is a complex thing and as such cannot be described exhaustively. It's so complex, in other words, that you can't even describe it altogether. Experience shows, and when Jung says experience shows, that means I think. You know, my thought is, so he says experience shows, in my experience. Experience shows that it rests on two seemingly different bases, the somatic and the psychic. Now, soma is the body, right? And psyche is the 
what? What is psyche? Mind spirit. Huh? Mind spirit. That's one way to talk about it. And we'll, we'll try to pin Jung down on what he means by psyche. As that's one of the points where his terms, you know, you aren't... How big is that term, psyche? What does that cover? What's the range of it? Uh, that's going to be one of our questions in this course. How to define some of these terms. And psyche is a tricky one. Let me tell you right now, psyche is a tricky term. But anyway, it's a, it dis, it's distinguished from the body, from the soma. That's one, you know, that's one limit on psyche. It isn't the body. It isn't somatic. The somatic basis is inferred now from the point of view of consciousness. The somatic basis is inferred from the totality of endosomatic perceptions which for their part are already of a psychic nature and are associated with the ego and are therefore conscious. Now, there is a sentence. <laughs> See, this is young now. The somatic basis, your body, how do you know what, what your body is? It's, in, it's an inference. From the psyche. From the psyche, through the psyche, you see. And that's one of Jung's fundamental positions, that everything you know is known through the psyche. That's an epistemological position, that you cannot get out of the psyche. You can say, I know my body immediately. I know my body concretely. I know my body as it is. And Jung would say, no, you don't. What you know is your perceptions of your body. And so we know our body as an inference, you know, from experience, we experience certain things in our body from the totality of endosomatic perceptions. In other words, you know your body from what you feel. You know, if you feel up with, some, if you feel some aches and pains, you know your body's there. You know, if your heart starts giving you problems, you know your heart is there. Otherwise, you don't even know that. I mean, you don't know your heart's there. But how do you feel your heart? Can you feel your heart beating? Well, you can, sort of indirectly, in some ways. Uh, or you can look at it in a, in a uh, what do they call those things now? You can see see your viscera and all that. But uh, basically, uh, from from the point of view of our consciousness, it's an inference based on our endosomatic perceptions. Your stomach rumbles. You're hungry. You feel an ache or a pain, and you know your body's there. You know something about it, and it affects your ego. Uh, and these perceptions are al already of a psychic nature. Now, here's that word psyche again. And are associated with the ego and are therefore conscious. Um, you see, if something is of a psychic nature, it has been made available to consciousness. And there you're starting to get close to Jung's definition of the psyche. It's something that, through a certain process, is made available to consciousness. Otherwise, it's not psyche. You can't psychologize it. You can't get a hold of it. If it's outside. So if you're in a sensory deprivation experiment. Yeah. Psyche's out in lunch? No. Uh, your senses are not uh, are not uh, the you know your senses are not exhaustive of psyche. Your senses are one of the things that gives you information and perception, but not the only thing. And besides, in, in sensory deprivation, your senses are hyperactive in some sense. You know, I mean, if you go into one of those tanks, you really start experiencing your body in a very different way. You hear it gurgling. You know. You can hear your, then you hear your heart, you know. So your your senses very kind of are very active. Feedback. Yeah. But uh, your senses are, are not the only thing that, that makes things into psyche. It's also your intuition, for example. Your intuition is uh, not exactly based on uh, senses. It can be related to senses, but you can have intuitions of things that have no are very little, minute quantities of sensory input, 
or where do your ideas come from? You know, you're aware of your ideas. Sometimes they have a sensory reference, and sometimes they don't much. So when Jung says we know everything through psyche or through our perceptions, he, that's a very large definition of perception. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's not sensory. Not just sensory. Not just sensory, right. That's a good point. Perception is larger than sensory. <clears throat> Now, these perceptions are produced by endosomatic stimuli, only some of which cross the threshold of consciousness. A considerable uh, portion of these stimuli occur unconsciously, that is, subliminally. The fact that they are subliminal does not necessarily mean that their status is merely physiological any more than this would be true of a psychic content. Sometimes they are capable of crossing the threshold, that is, of becoming perceptions, but there is no doubt that a large proportion of these endosomatic stimuli are simply incapable of consciousness and are so elementary that there is no reason to assign them a psychic nature. In other words, uh, it's very hard to uh, probe to send out psychic probes into your sympathetic nervous system, you know, into what your body is doing uh, all on its own, autonomously. You know, the heart is beating, you're breathing, uh, blood is circulating, your neurons are firing, you know, all that's going on all the time, Uh, some of which can become the material of consciousness and some of which can't. That's a very interesting question how far can you develop that capacity of psyche to penetrate into the somatic base? You see, I think some people can go much further than other people. The yogis claim they can go almost all the way. They can will their death. They can say, tomorrow at 12 o'clock, I'm going to die. And uh, they don't commit suicide the way we would with pills or a gun or something. They (laughs) simply die. They stop their heart. They can stop their heart tomorrow at 12 o'clock. Uh, or they can do other things. In, they can get down into the, some, and I'm saying they, I mean, experiments have been done, I guess, at Menninger's, wasn't it? That's, uh, they, they tested a yogi's ability to change the temperature in the palm of his hand, and he could do it by will. I don't know, 10 or 20 degrees. He could say, now I'm going to warm it up, and it warms up. Now I'm going to cool it down, and it cools down. So there, there is a psychic capacity to penetrate more or less deeply into the somatic base. But even the yogi has his limitations. There are probably some things he can't do. We don't know how far it can go. But uh, it can go a lot further than than most of us take it. And yet there, I would assume there is a limit how far down into the cellular substructure can a yogi shrink, shrink a cancerous tumor, for example. Maybe he can. Maybe some he can and some he can't. Things like that. Imaging. How far does imaging go? Well, with some people it goes further than with others. Mike? There's one problem. In what, when we start off talking about the body and the suke is separate, and in one sense the body is already in soul. It's, in one sense, we, we, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we would want to... I mean, I know what he's struggling with. In one sense, we're talking about the body still in its dead manner. That in, an, in another sense, the body's already... In soul, live psychic. Well, the psyche, of the body's already. In the let's read the rest of this sentence. Unless, of course, one favors the philosophical view that all life processes are psychic anyway. Now, he he doesn't want to identify with that position. He says the chief objection to this hardly demonstrable hypothesis is that it enlarges the concept of the psyche beyond all bounds and interprets the life process in a way not absolutely warranted by the facts. Concepts that are too broad usually prove to be unsuitable instruments because they are not too vague and nebulous. I've therefore suggested that the term psychic be used only where there is evidence of a will capable of modifying reflex or instinctual processes. See, he's drawing a line. He says, if you can get down into your body to the point where your will can change that tumor, then I'll call that psychic. If you can't, then there's a limit to psyche. That's where he's drawing the line. And he attaches it to will, to the ego, in other words. 
So psyche and ego are very deeply connected. Now, a lot of people don't know this about Jung's theory, that psyche, in, as he defines it here, is limited by where the ego can go. If the ego can't go there, it's not psyche anymore. So when you get into the question of is the archetype per se part of the psyche, we'll get into that later, he would have to say no. It's not part of the psyche. Is the archetype per se part of the psyche? Jung would have to say no because you can't get down to that level with your will, with your ego. Right. As far as you can experience it, that is psyche. What is experienceable, in other words, is psychic. What is experienceable by your conscious, ego consciousness, is psyche. Now that's the boundary of psyche. Now sometimes Jung uses that term psyche in a much looser way, and that's what's confusing, right? Sometimes he'll throw out the word psyche and say what I mean by that is the soul or what I mean by that is the whole psychic apparatus or is the whole personality and then you start wondering well does that include x y and z well keep that in mind we're going to have to take our break and then we'll come back and we can ask some questions okay 10 minutes about in the next paragraph now keep in mind, you know, what Jung said, how he defined psyche, because that's a word that will be coming up as we go along many, many times. Uh, and particularly important in uh, when we read the paper on the nature of the psyche, whenever that has been assigned. Incidentally, uh, as far as the assignment goes, you're all clear that tomorrow we read a review of the complex theory and in volume eight and on Wednesday on psychic energy and then on Thursday on the nature of the psyche. And if you have a chance to read ahead, do so on the nature of the psyche, I think is Jung's single most important theoretical essay. It is incredibly rich and dense and, and uh, carefully thought out. Um, so if there's one place you want to spend extra time on, I would suggest that one. Um, here he suggests using the term psychic only where there is evidence of a will capable of modifying reflex or instinctual processes. So reflex and instinctual processes that cannot be modified by a will by a will, meaning not only the ego's will, and we'll have to, when we get into complex theory, we'll see that there are other wills besides the ego's will. We aren't just made up of one will. But um, reflex actions and uh, instinctual processes that cannot be modified by any will are no longer psychic. They're outside of the psyche. The somatic basis of the ego consists then of conscious and unconscious factors. The same is true of the psychic basis. On the one hand, the ego rests on the total field of consciousness, which we've talked about, everything that you're conscious of. On the other, on the sum total of unconscious contents. Now these fall into three groups. First, the temporarily subliminal contents that can be re reproduced voluntarily. In other words, your consciousness isn't full all the time, every second of everything that it's capable of being conscious of. You forget things, you can remember them, you can you can call them up, you know, you have a, a bank of possibilities there. If your memory is still intact, you know, you can recall names and places and so on and so forth. So those are only temporarily unconscious. They're easy to call up. Second, there are unconscious contents that cannot be reproduced voluntarily. That's what we'll call the complexes when we get into that tomorrow. And third, there are contents that are not capable of becoming conscious at all. And these would be the archetypes. Group two 
can be inferred, again, that word inference, from the spontaneous eruption of subliminal contents into consciousness. That's what we'll talk about tomorrow, how the complexes affect consciousness. They're spontaneous eruptions. Group three is hypothetical. So the theory of the archetypes is a hypothesis. It is a logical inference from the facts underlying group two. So the way we, the, the reason Jung thinks there are archetypes is that there are certain consistencies in the complexes or patterns. But it's a hypothesis. And you must always remember that Jung is, is often, you know, speaking as a scientist now, he, he has a fundamental identity as a scientist. So when he says hypothesis, He's not, he, he means it. He isn't talking about doctrines and dogmas. You know, archetypes are a dogma. They're a hypothesis. Something very important to remember when thinking about his theory. Yeah. What does he say? You can never conclude yourself. I mean, an analysis doesn't become a point. There's a limit. There's a limit. And we'll, we'll get into that later. There's a limit beyond which you can't go. And so there, there are contents... There, in the unconscious, because unconscious simply means you don't know, what, you know, it's un the unknown, but their existence can be inferred indirectly, but can't be experienced directly. It's like the stars that can be seen by inference from, radio, from uh, radiations or something, you know, and you get these little dots on a, on a plate and, you know, somebody applies a mathematical formula to it and they say, well, what's really out there is probably this. What we, Here's the evidence. Look at this. And you look at that and you say, well, I don't see any stars on your plate. No, no it's, you know, there are all kinds of thinking behind this and that's why we think this makes sense. And if you went out there and you could get there, you could actually see it. But we're limited. We can't see it. We can't get out that far. All we've got is these instruments and we think they're giving us valid information, but, you know, are we absolutely sure? No, we're not. But it's a it's a good uh, inf you know a good hypothesis. So it contains it is group three. It contains contents which have not yet erupted into consciousness or which never will. You know there are contents there that never will erupt into consciousness. Will never affect you, but they're there. It's hypothetical because it's always as if we can't experience it directly. Right. It's an as if, yeah. We can see some effects, and from those effects, we think there's something behind that. Right? The effects are strong enough, consistent enough that he feels entitled to That's right. Make the That's right. Exactly. He wants to caution that it's still an influence. Yeah. So he doesn't want you to read him as, uh, as though he's laying out dogma, you know, doctrine. Yeah. It's not like that. Well, a lot of people read it like that. That's why I'm saying, you know, I'm warning you, don't read it like that. Uh, if you want to be a good Jungian, you won't read it like that. There are some who kind of read, uh, get a doctrine and then, you know, go out and preach it and try to apply it and so on. And really, it's just a hypothesis, you know. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of imagining what might be the case. When I said that the ego rests on the total field of consciousness... I do not mean that it consists of this. Okay, now he wants to talk some more about the ego. Were that so, it would be indistinguishable from the field of consciousness as a whole. So he wants to say the ego is not... Um, the ego can be distinguished from the contents of consciousness or from the field of consciousness. That's what I was talking about before. The I... William James made a very interesting distinction when he wrote about psychology pre-Jung, but Jung read him, and he may have used, picked up some ideas. James made the distinction between the I and the me. And he said the me is, your, is the stream of consciousness. It's like a stream, you know, lots of stuff out there in it, and you can look at this and you can look at that. That's the me. But the I is a point or a dot that enters the stream at certain intervals or certain places. So uh, driving over here this morning, for example, I uh, suddenly realized I was uh, on a route that I hadn't intended to take. You know, I was thinking about other things, and I wasn't in any accidents, you know. Uh, 
I'm sure I drove within the within the speed limits. I'm in the habit of doing that because I've had a couple of tickets and I've trained myself to, <laughs> to, to keep it down. And you know, I've noticed other cars and I didn't bump into anything. So obviously, I was conscious. I wasn't asleep, but my ego wasn't there. You see, there is a difference between consciousness and the ego. My ego was occupied with other things. I was thinking, what am I going to say this morning? What order am I going to put it? Do I really uh, have I spend enough time on this, you know, maybe I should have done something, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and thinking about conversations I'd had over the weekend. and So that, you know, the ego is occupied one place and consciousness is running along somewhere else. You can split yourself that way. Yes? Well, you raise an interesting thing now. Uh, it doesn't have much light to cast on what part of consciousness was doing the driving now. Yeah. Well, the, you see, the ego got into the car and got going. There's intentionality there in consciousness. I had to get in the car, get my keys out, turn on the ignition, and set off in a certain direction. The ego is involved in that. <clears throat> but then uh, the ego can go someplace else, and consciousness takes over. So you, you know, consciousness is doing it. If something comes up, the ego is suddenly back in it. You know, if somebody would swerve in front of me, or there would be a dangerous moment or something, I'd come to myself, oh my goodness, what's going on here? Then the ego is right back and ready to go. But uh, what's driving the car? It isn't the ego then. It isn't, uh, it's, uh, it's consciousness based on certain habits and, you know, awarenesses and so on. So you wouldn't say it was a complex. No, I wouldn't say it was a complex. An auto automobile complex? <laughs> so, now, we'll get into what, what, how do you know when you're in a complex tomorrow? That's, it, it's a subtle difference. It's a very good question you ask. It's a very subtle difference, but it isn't. Well, couldn't you say the driving was being done by consciousness, which had been practiced, and there was a yeah. reflexive aspect Right, and it could be brought under the control of the ego. The ego could intervene. Well, in the, the ego, because of this practice and the you know the automatic yeah. part of it, the ego could go elsewhere because you didn't you already right. knew you knew how to drive. Yeah, yeah. Riding and you already taught yourself to stay thing. at the speed limit. Right. So I didn't have to be overly alert and watchful of it. Yeah. Yeah, sort of like yeah. maybe like more like instinct. You it's not instinct, it's training. There's a difference between instinct and training. Tra instinct is something that is there. Oh, we just want to keep our terms straight. I mean, yeah, colloquially, one would say, I drove by instinct. But technically, you wouldn't say that. By instinct, you don't drive. By instinct, you are driven. Okay. You, know? you, were, receiving, you were still receiving and responding appropriately to stimuli. I mean, yeah, it wasn't, consciousness. It wasn't totally... Um, no, no. That's right. Well, more or less. I mean, there. You know, consciousness is taking in and monitoring, but it isn't under ego control. The ego is where the eye is. See, that's what we need to understand. The ego is where, the, and the eye can move around within the field of consciousness. The eye can attend to driving. The eye can wander off while driving, doing something else. The, the eye is this dot that William James, you know, said, it can dip into the stream of consciousness at any point. And now it dips in here and it's doing this. Meanwhile, there's lots of other stuff going on in consciousness too. You know, your consciousness is monitoring stuff all the time, taking it in, processing it, reacting to it, uh, and your ego is busy doing something else. So your consciousness, your consciousness my consciousness was driving the car. My consciousness got me there. No, I wasn't unconscious. I wasn't driving unconsciously. When you're unconscious, now you can do some things unconsciously, but uh, you don't drive a car unconsciously unless you're sleepwalking or something like that. Well, you hurt people unconsciously, for example. You know. Uh, you don't intend to do it, but you do it. Or there's a motive that's unconscious that's operating and working and doing things. That's another will, you know, another part of your will that's doing things. 
but that isn't the case if you're just driving a car. You know, your intention is to get from here to there. You get in the car, you start going. It's routine, and you drift off somewhere. So your routinized, habituated consciousness is operating. If a crisis intervenes, your ego will come back to that point, engage it, change what, what needs to be changed, and then you're in the ego again. So when we say, where, where are you in the ego? You know, that's where are you conscious? Where is your point of consciousness? Is it, is, it, is it another dimension, perhaps, of here and now versus past and future? In a way, you're, you're thinking about the future when you're not driving, as opposed to being in the Or about the past. About or, the past. Yeah. Your, your ego is focused on another area of your consciousness, on a memory or a thought or a feeling or a plan. See? Okay. It's at a different point in the stream. As opposed to... Right here and now, driving, right. driving the car. Right. When I talk, you drift in and out. You know, you're listening to me, and then I say something, and you make some associations, and your ego drifts off, and then you come back. You know, I do that all the time too. If I'm listening to somebody, your associations draw you in a certain direction. Oh, that's an interesting thought. I think, I'll, and then you come back. What did he say? I, I missed something there. You know? So your ego wanders around. Uh, it's a very uh, well-trained ego that will stay where you intend it to, you know. It, uh, now we get into that question, what is it to be an intentional ego, to have a well-trained ego? I mean, there are levels of ego development, you know. How does the ego develop? Well, let's, t let's go on. Jung talks about that here, too. It's an interesting idea. But he wants to say that the ego doesn't consist of what it rests on. It doesn't consist of its consciousness, it can remove itself from that consciousness and go someplace else, you see. It's another thing, another psychic thing. So that's what I started out trying to make a distinction between the contents of consciousness and the ego. Okay? Although its bases are in themselves relatively unknown and unconscious, both psychic and somatic, the ego is a conscious factor par excellence. That means it is like the conscious factor. It's even acquired, empirically speaking, during the individual's lifetime. Now that that's debatable, but I mean he, sta he would take that position as a, you know, from an empirical point of view, what you can observe. We don't know that this I comes from another planet, another dimension, another anything. Empirically speaking, it looks like it's acquired when a child is conceived spends time in the womb, is born, and goes through life. Now, some people would say that I is the soul, and it comes from another dimension, and it's lived many times before. It just forgets what it's experienced before, and now it's here this time. You know what I mean? That reincarnation philosophy. But empirically speaking, the I is acquired during the individual's lifetime. It seems to arise in the first place from the collision between the somatic factor and the environment. And once established as a subject, it goes on developing from further collisions with the outer world and the inner. So how does the ego develop? Through collisions or conflict, you could say. What makes you grow? What makes your ego grow? Conflict, trouble, anguish, sorrow, <laughs> you know, suffering. It's where you collide either with yourself, something within you, internal uh, disharmony or uh, at odds with yourself, like a neurotic conflict, you know, disagreeing parts of yourself, or you collide with the environment around you. Now, he says it gets set off. You could say the potential for an ego is always there, but it doesn't actually come into being until there is a collision between the somatic factor, the little infant's body, banging against the environment, suffering a deprivation of hunger, let's say. Um, and when there is this collision and the infant opens its eyes, gets hungry, starts crying and screaming, and feels that discomfort, and then, you know, hopefully the d discomfort is taken care of and it can uh, be fed and feel good and go back to sleep again, it, then it's not in a state of collision, but then it wakes up and it's hungry again and it screams. And through this process, 
and ego comes into being. Well, intentionality, right? I want. I'm hungry. I want. That's the collision, the original collision. I want to eat. Um, Michael Fordham, who we won't study, but I'll refer to a number of other Jungians as we go along through this course. Uh, Michael Fordham, as an English Jungian analyst, wrote uh, a book called um, Children as Individuals. And he's one of the leading child theoreticians, developmental theoreticians in the Jungian camp. And his theory is that one develops through what he calls series of deintegration, reintegration sequences. Okay, <clears throat> the deintegration is when you're colliding with the environment. Your needs then get met. You reintegrate, come back to a kind of harmonious stasis. The infant going back to sleep and so on. And then when you experience the need again or the or the uh, uh, wish or desire. You deintegrate and you have this screaming and carrying on and, and that's a deintegrated state. The need gets met. And through these sequences, uh, the person comes into consciousness. Uh, he elaborates that some more with uh, Jungian theory, but that's the basic idea. And it, it takes off from a notion like this in Jung, that the ego gets its uh, beginning, has its origin in a collision between the soma, between the body and the environment, and then after that grows, uh, strengthens itself, so to speak, becomes a firmer will through more collisions. Now, you could say that some collisions are so uh, catastrophic that it destroys it, or it, it injures and cripples it to an extraordinary extent so that it doesn't doesn't um, <clears throat> strengthen the ego, but rather weakens it. And I think that's what you get into with various kinds of pathologies, maybe early developmental deprivations and so on. Yeah. Is the stronger will, the stronger attention, or is it the capacity to change? Is it the stronger will, the stronger attention, or is it the capacity to control the situation? Yeah. Well, it extends. It, it extends into that. You could say that the beginning ego is simply um, a cry of anguish that there is a discrepancy between need and satisfaction. Well, that, of course, gets elaborated so that by the time a child is two and is saying no to everybody, you know, they're trying to control a lot of things. That little ego is very busy building itself by creating collisions, you know, and that the no and I won't and all of that is is seen as an attempt to both separate and create a stronger center of internal will and intentionality and control. Control is a big issue. Well, when autonomy is achieved, supposedly at the age of three or four, you know, Erickson's second or third stage, whatever that is, uh, autonomy, um, that... Uh, issue in a sense gets settled for a time but it continues throughout life so that autonomy is one of the uh, desires of the ego to control consciousness basically control what's going on in consciousness that's what the ego is trying to do so whatever enters the realm of consciousness it tries to control uh, the will to control is fundamental to the ego. And so when you meet up with somebody who's very controlling, we say, they've got a kind of ego that hasn't got enough control yet. You see, they're a very controlling person because of the anxiety about control over their conscious contents. So they need to control you. You've entered their field now. You're a part of their conscious, their field of consciousness that produces a kind of anxiety because that field is not under enough control, and so they reach out and try to control you. Anything that enters the field, then. Now, you could say an ego in whom, a person in whom the ego has enough autonomy, has, that issue is settled enough at an early age, early stage of development, and continues throughout their lifetime. Hopefully, uh, that's, you know, stage of development persists throughout. They don't need to control everything that comes into their environment or into their 
consciousness because they have an experience of enough control. If they need to control it, they can, so they don't have to as much. It's the one that's anxious about it that has to do so much, put so much extra effort into it. So we get to the question of what is a strong ego and what's a weak ego. Ultimately, a strong ego is is uh, an ego that isn't overly anxious about mastering the collisions because it's had enough good experience doing that, let's say, and therefore can ha- can afford less defenses. Uh, so sometimes a very strong person is somebody who can let... It doesn't look very strong, you see. I mean, it's a person who can let a lot of stuff into consciousness without worrying about it too much, into the field of awareness, into the into life. You can kind of be a little more open. You can afford it because there is the experience that when necessary, the ego can control its consciousness enough so that you can survive and get your needs met. Um, sometimes the person who looks like a strong personality overbearing and controlling and, you know, making a big splash and churning up everything in their environment and bringing it under control is actually, from a theoretical point of view, a weak ego, an anxious ego. That is, someone who hasn't had enough experience of mastery in that field of consciousness. And uh, therefore um, is trying to act that out on, on everything that enters so um, this notion that the ego develops through collisions, I think, is an important one to keep in mind. It gives you a, I'd say, a positive and creative way of thinking about that inevitability in life that uh, we all have to face over and over again, namely the intractability uh, of the environment, inner and outer, uh, when the ego tries to apply its uh, its will, and uh, when you meet that uh, collision, uh, if you handle it well, you can grow from it. That's how you grow from collisions. Most of us try to avoid collisions at all costs, of course, because we'd rather be integrated and harmonious and, you know, live a nice, quiet, peaceful life and have all our needs met automatically as soon as we think them. That's paradise. That's a paradise (laughs) fantasy. You see, that's Adam and Eve in paradise and everything comes to them and the apples are growing on trees. Mm -hmm. That's what my son is doing in Hawaii. He says, out there, you don't have to work. You just go out, pick it off the trees. You know, it just all comes easy. <laughs> you don't have to pay taxes. <laughs> you avoid that whole world of conflict and collision. <clears throat> yeah, the creative leap. Right, exactly. That's that's the basis of her work in that book. That through crisis, you know, these, uh, which is another way of talking about the collision, the ego can grow and and uh, yeah, Mike, I heard you gasp. Oh. <laughs> crisis. crisis. You're having a crisis. There's no ego. So there is no ego until there's the absence, the experience of uh, need or the cry of rage. Bad breath, whatever. Yeah. There, there is no ego. No ego starts to emerge. It doesn't get activated. You could just have a plain field of consciousness, right? I mean, just sort of, and the ego would be latent in it, quiescent. You know, don't need to intend everything. If you know, it's just all supplied. So this is an argument for creating optimal frustrations in children, and that is to be distinguished from maximal frustrations. You know, optimal is titrated. It's tuned into what a person can stand and, and can master. So it's usually a mistake to interfere too quickly if a child is struggling with something, to, to write or draw. You know, they get frustrated uh, or trying to do their homework and then the parent comes in and does everything and types it up on the computer and sends it in. The kid gets an A. You know, and I mean, it's a terrible mistake to, to take the strain off too much. But if the strain's too great to intervene a little bit, just enough you know, to make it tolerable. Right. A little bit of frustration. Yeah. Choosing the crisis to that would be 
really. Choosing your crises, yeah. <laughs> you several ways that either one are going to be a crisis. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. The grand, the role of the grandparent is this uh, usually a paradisal kind of figure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Then you're intervening in a complex system. They're your children. You're intervening with them, you know, sort of you through them. them. <laughs> right? You leap, leap the generations. Um, okay, Jung goes on to, let's see, speak about the ego as free will and choice sub- and the subjective feeling of freedom. That's an interesting point two um, paragraph nine the ego is by definition subordinate to the self which is a master concept of the whole personality we'll get into that in much more detail later but this is to indicate that the ego is a part of a larger whole it can separate itself from the stream of consciousness it can move around it can go in and there in and out of consciousness but it is itself part of a larger system like the earth is part of the solar system you can think of it that way for a long time we thought the earth was the center you know of the whole universe and everything revolved around it and then we became aware that it's actually revolves around something else around the sun and that's similar to the awareness one gets after a while that the ego is revolving around something larger than itself, around another center of gravity. But um, inside the field of consciousness, the ego has, as we say, free will. By this I do not mean anything philosophical, only the well-known psychological fact of free choice, or rather the subjective feeling of freedom. That's very important. You know, When you get into arguments about are we really free or are we conditioned, you know, that we make our choices on the basis of conditioning. You know, we want certain things because we've been conditioned to want them, and we feel free in making those choices. But what we're actually choosing is between uh, Milky Ways and Mars bars, you know, and, and we've been programmed to eat candy, and so we think we're making a great free choice by choosing Milky Way against Mars bars. But that's what you do with children, too, you know. You, 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 you don't take them into the department store and turn them loose. You say, now you can choose between this uh, kind of shirt, that kind of shirt, or that kind of shirt. You have a choice, right? And the child feels very good then. It, it, it's free to make a choice. It isn't being imposed on. But you're limiting the area of choice. Now, in fact, if you wanted to um, look at the range of actual freedom, you'd have to say something like that. We're very limited by what we can choose from, by what's put in front of us. What, by our conditioning and all of that. But we have the feeling of free choice. That feeling of free choice is, the e- is an ego feeling. Just as our free will clashes with necessity in the outside world, so it also finds its limits outside the field of consciousness in the subjective inner world where it comes into conflict with the facts of the self. Okay, so we are, in fact, limited by what's offered to us in the outside world and what the outside world is willing to give us politically and economically and so on. We all know those kind of limitations. But when we get into psychology, depth psychology, we also discover that we're limited by other factors that he calls inner factors, and that's what we'll explore tomorrow and thereafter, what these inner factors are, what limits us on the inside uh, from exercising what we feel is free choice. Well, just a broad approximation, you could say our emotional life limits us. Our reactions limit us. We want to do one thing and we do another thing. St. Paul's cry, you know, that which I would do I cannot do and that which I do not want to do I do. You know, what is that? What What is that demon? So every one of us has an inner other or several others who conflict with what the ego 
feels it wants to do. And just as circumstances or outside events happen to us and limit our freedom, so the self acts upon the ego like an objective occurrence which free will can do very little to alter. When you experience the self, Jung says somewhere very late in life, uh, it's always experienced as a defeat of the ego. That's why you know you've experienced the self, that the ego feels defeated, limited, in collision with some inner fact or developmental fact or uh, necessity that it can't control. It can't exercise its will upon. It can confront, can com- come into collision with, can grow from, but it can't control it. Uh, so we'd say the, the very conscious person is someone who knows that about himself or herself as an inner fact as well as an outer. Every one of us knows that as an outer fact after the age of 21 or 25 or whatever. We realize we can't control the world outside of us. But very few people come to the conclusion of the realization, the consciousness, that they also can't control their own inner destiny. Is the reverse true? A defeat for the ego is always a, an experience for the self? I mean, the potential, I guess, is there. Potential is there, yeah. And I'm wondering, um, the things that limit us outside and the things that limit us from the inside, I don't know about that. We can we'll talk about that when we get to the subject of synchronicity. That's it's a there probably are some ways in which that's true and some in which it's not. Yeah. Could you give an example of the practice of someone who's being limited by the self, whose ego is being limited by the self? Um, I'd like to save that for um, when we get into the discussion of the self. It's a little premature to do that because we have to distinguish between the self and complexes and archetypes and all of that. Um, But... Uh, if you've ever tried to control your emotional reactions to something, you know what a struggle that can be. That, that's beginning to approximate it. You're, uh, you know, you go into a situation feeling that you're going to be one way, you're going to control your consciousness, and you end up doing and thinking and feeling something very different. It feels sort of out of control. Something else has happened. So it's, it's something like that. Uh, you know, you'd like to be a certain kind of person, you end up a different kind of person. So uh, the idea is that basically somewhere in us we are patterned to develop in a certain direction, and we will become that whether we want to or not. You know, it's like uh, you look in the mirror and you realize how much you look like your father or your mother. There's not much you can do about that. Well, you can go to plastic surgeons nowadays <laughs> and alter that, but... Basically, you become your genetic makeup, in a, uh, and individuation is something like that, that you can't control your individuation process. It will do its thing. Now, the ego experiences that in a variety of ways, creatively or as defeats or humiliations or whatever. Um, but um, basically, it's like coming to terms with what you are, really, fundamentally. And that can be felt as a great defeat. It can be felt otherwise, too. But uh, uh, We've just got a few minutes left, and there was there were two things that I wanted to share with you before we leave. One's a poem, and one's a little reading from um, Jung's autobiography. Lee should read this, but I'll do it since I'm... In charge here. This is a poem called in the, in, the ego of the <laughs> in the Waiting Room. This is a poem by Elizabeth Bishop, and she refers to an experience that she had when she was a child of six or seven or eight, whatever it is. She mentions the age in here. Uh, and it is an experience of the ego and of having an ego 
and the surprise at having an ego and what that ego is. You see, I mean, it's one thing, an infant has an ego in a rudimentary form, a two-year-old has, an 80-year-old has, but there is a moment when you experience your ego and you realize, I am I am an I. You know? That experience is what this poem is about. The awareness of having an ego, of being an ego. It's called In the Waiting Room. In in Worcester, Massachusetts, I went with Aunt Consuelo to keep her dentist's appointment and sat and waited for her in the dentist's waiting room. It was winter. It got dark early. The waiting room was full of grown-up people, arctics and overcoats, lamps and magazines. My aunt was inside what seemed like a long time, and while I waited, I read the National Geographic I could read and carefully studied the photographs, the inside of a volcano black and full of ashes. Then it was spilling over in rivulets of fire. Oza and Martin Johnson dressed in riding breeches, laced boots and pith helmets. A dead man slung on a pole. Long pig, the caption said. Babies with pointed heads wound round and round with string. Black, naked women with necks wound round and round with wire like the necks of light bulbs. Their breasts were horrifying. I read it right straight through. I was too shy to stop. (laughs) And then I looked at the cover, the yellow margins, the date. Suddenly, from inside came an O of pain and Consuela's voice not very loud or long. I wasn't at all surprised. Even then I knew she was a foolish, timid woman. I might have been embarrassed, but wasn't. What took me completely by surprise was that it was me, my voice in my mouth. Without thinking at all, I was my foolish aunt. I, we, were falling, falling, our eyes glued to the cover of the National Geographic, February 1918. I said to myself, three days and you'll be seven years old. I was saying it to stop the sensation of falling off the round, turning world into cold, blue-black space. But I felt, you are an I. You are an Elizabeth. You are one of them. Why should you be one too? I scarcely dared to look to see what it was I was. (laughs) I gave a sidelong glance. I couldn't look any higher at shadowy gray knees, trousers and skirts and boots and different pairs of hands lying under the lamps. I knew that nothing stranger had ever happened, that nothing stranger could ever happen. Why should I be my aunt or me or anyone? What similarities, boots, hands, the family voice I felt in my throat or even the National Geographic and those awful hanging breasts held us all together or made us all just one? How? I didn't know any word for it. How unlikely. How had I come to be here like them and overhear a cry of pain that could have been that could have got loud and worse but hadn't? The waiting room was bright and too hot. It was sliding beneath a big black wave, another and another. Then I was back in it. The war was on outside in Worcester, Massachusetts, where night and slush and cold, and it was still the 5th of February, 1918. But that experience of an I, you see, is both unique. I'm unique. I'm an I, and I'm like everybody else. Everybody else has an I, too. And I sound just like Aunt Consuela, and I can do that, you know, that paradox that... The I is absolutely unique and individual and you and the essence of you, and yet it's absolutely universal. Everybody has one. And do they have one that's any different from yours? Is the I of those poor black people in National Geographic suffering in Africa from their tortures and so on any different from your I? Do they all belong together? Are they all pieces of one thing? What is it? See, that's the mystery of the eye. We don't know what it is. And then this paragraph from Jung's um, autobiography, 
Jung had a theory about why we have an eye, cosmically speaking. He wants to give the eye a cosmic significance. He wants to say we have consciousness of a special kind as a species for a reason. Why do we have an eye? Here's what he thinks. He's in Africa. And he's traveling out from Nairobi, and he says, we used a small ford to visit the Athi Plains, a great game preserve. From a low hill in this broad savanna, a magnificent prospect opened out to us. To the very brink of the horizon, we saw gigantic herds of animal, animals, gazelle, antelope, gnu, zebra, warthog, and so on, grazing, heads nodding. The herds moved forward like slow rivers. There was scarcely any sound save the melancholy cry of a bird of prey. This was the stillness of the eternal beginning, the world as it had always been, in the state of non-being. For until then, no one had been present to know that it was this world. I walked away from my companions until I had put them out of sight and savored the feeling of being entirely alone. There I was now, the first human being to recognize that this was the world, but who did not know that in this moment he had first really created it. There the cosmic meaning of consciousness became overwhelmingly clear to me. What nature leaves imperfect, the art perfects, say the alchemists. Man, I, in an invisible act of creation, put the stamp of perfection on the world by giving it objective existence. This act we usually ascribe to the Creator alone without considering that in so doing we view life as a machine calculated down to the last detail, which along with the human psyche runs on senselessly obeying foreknown and predetermined rules. In such a cheerless clockwork fantasy there is no drama of man, world, and God. There is no new day leading to new shores, but only the dreariness of calculated processes. My old Pueblo friend came to my mind. He thought that the raison d'etre of his Pueblo had been to help their father, the sun, to cross the sky each day. I had envied him for the fullness of meaning in that belief and had been looking about without hope for a myth of our own. Now I knew what it was and knew even more, that man is indispensable for the completion of creation, that in fact he himself is the second creator of the world, who alone has given to the world its objective existence, without which, unheard, unseen, silently eating, giving birth, dying, heads nodding through the hundreds of millions of years, it would have gone on in the profoundest night of non-being down to its unknown end. Human consciousness (coughs) created objective existence and meaning, and man found his indispensable place in the great process of being. So... That is the achievement of uh, meaning that an individual ego can attain to. It's a very important thing you've got. It's a tremendous treasure. And it's there for a purpose. Okay? So I'll leave you on that inspiring note. And we'll continue tomorrow. If you are interested in continuing the series, The Union Psyche, A Deeper Look at Analytical Psychology, follow the link in the show notes or go to youngchicago.org slash store. The content of this episode is copyright Murray Stein. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.